I have failed at very few things. And I'm afraid. I didn't come here to give you a rose. I came here to give you a reality check. You guys are essentially out of business right now. You're a powerful man, and that is not an easy thing to work with. I think you're going to be surprised. The risk is high, but if it works, the payoff is huge. I want to thank y'all because my life is riding on this. Let's go. Oh, thank you so much. Let's go to work. The Profit returns Tuesday, November 21st, and catch up on demand. CNBC, get yours. Hello. I'll get it after. Don't worry about it. How are you, buddy? Good. Marcus, thanks for joining Who's us. Who's excited? All right. So, Marcus, James, I, I just have to tell you this before we get started. You tell like, me. I had a lot of anxiety this morning when I got up. I was like, my hair, I don't have a lot. I'm going to be sitting with a guy that has a lot of hair. <laughs> well, I, but I, I never brush it, so at least I'm more, I'm messier than you. You always have like a good yeah, clean Yeah, but you look. have a lot of it. <laughs> you know, Can I, should I, borrow probably, some? I should probably brush it more. <laughs> no, you look good. So, so, Marcus, I have a ton of questions to ask you, but... Really, what I'm kind of insanely curious about is how do you get it all done? So you're a CEO yeah. of a multi-billion dollar public company, Camping World, yeah. and you're pro how, many, how many companies are you invested in now in just through the profit alone? I'm sure you have other investments. You know, uh, I'm invested in probably about 109, I think, is the number now. But so in some cases, right, they're not active. And I think that's important. In some cases, you know, there's probably, if I include Camping World as one. Uh, but you can't include Camping World as one. No, I know. But if I do, I probably have 50 businesses at all time that I have pretty high touch with. And high touch for me is at least twice a week for more than two minutes. It's a, I mean, it's real interaction. So if you combine that high touch with 50 businesses, yeah. plus running yeah. the, the multi-billion dollar yeah. company, Plus, as you know, and maybe people don't realize, to shoot a 44-minute episode yeah. must require 40 hours of work each episode. Yes. Like, how do you, I don't think I would be able to be that efficient. And I want to get into all the things that are, are critical, but, but this is just your productivity is yeah, interesting here, to me. Here's what I would say. Um, you know, to be a small business owner or to be a business owner, it's not a glamorous job like everybody thinks it is, right? Everybody thinks it's this glamorous thing. It, uh, it requires you to make a lot of personal sacrifices. And you know, you, if you want to meet a small business owner that has a great home life and a great life balance, they're probably BSing you a little bit. It's very difficult to be a business owner and have balance. And I would be honest with you, I don't have good work-life balance. I just don't. But the reason I'm comfortable with it is that I really love what I do. And unlike other shows that you interview that are about small business, other people, our show is, is, it takes eight days to make one episode of The Profit. And we probably have 60 to 70 hours of footage to get to 42 minutes. And the problem is, it isn't making the show, the problem is what happens after. Like, these are real people that have to have real interaction. And over the last couple of years, what I've done is I've really built these pods a manufacturing group, a food group, a retail group, a fashion group. Um, and I have leaders of those pods, and they happen to be business owners that were on the profit. So I really resisted bringing people from the outside in because I wanted them to be able to talk and speak to the culture of how this really works. And it's been nice for me to have, um, by the way, most of them are run by women, I think, yeah. Most of them are run by women. It, only the women clap for that? Is that how this is going to work? Okay. We'll have, we're going to have some fun today. Um, but it's, it's, it's not as hard as people think. It really isn't. Well, I, you know, it seems like film, going in and filming the episodes plus dealing with all the business issues. I mean, let's, let's segue right into that. Um, you, you talk a lot on the show and in interviews and in so on you, you, about you look for people process product. And so it's not like, from what I can see on the show, it's not like you look for excellent people process product because sometimes the opportunity is when one of these three, three things are broken, but you see low hanging fruit you can fix. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's any different than anybody's business in here, right? And, and the reason that I chose to really push people, process, and product wasn't because it was a marketing tool or it was cute. I really did it because it was simple and easy for people to understand. And it doesn't really matter what kind of business you go into. If you think about your own business or your own desire to grow your business, you really have to make sure that you have these things. And I, I'll explain it in a very simplistic way. You have to really have a product or service that people can understand, they can relate to, and it's something relevant. So you could be an amazing person and want to talk about having an 8-track cassette company with a great process, and I mean, it's not, it's not going to work. <laughs> And you can, be, you can have the greatest product in the world, but have no process on how to source the product, or how to deliver the service, or how to write the code, or how to get the technology implemented, and so that won't matter. Or you can have a great process and a great pro product, but you are, you are not really operating at a high level of sincerity or ethics or your people don't your business really doesn't possess the kind of people skills that are required to engage with customers and no matter what your business is in this room no matter what you're trying to build or what you have it really does require a relationship with a consumer whether that's a b2b consumer or a b2c consumer you have to have a relationship and if you don't have good people skills or a good fabric it becomes very difficult to connect with people and you better be selling something that nobody else has at a very low price with a super efficient process if you don't have good skills to deal with people. Well, l l let me ask about that a little further because it seems like in almost all the episodes, and maybe this is just how it's edited or filmed, but it seems like in all of the episodes, the most important thing is the people. Without the right people, it's just going to, if, if, the, if the partners don't get along, yeah. if they don't treat their, you, like then you have in the last episode of but, last but season. But James, but think about this though, right? Why do businesses typically fail? I think because people don't get along with their partners right. or their employees and then, and then the process and product fall apart. It, 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 or they never get developed, right? Right. In, in most cases, uh, the primary reason that I did the show was to create a syllabus for people on the different human interactions that you may experience yourself or you may see and how to deal with them. And so there's, a, there's, like, a, there's like a matrix of, of, of scenarios. Father, son, mother, daughter, cousins, husband, wife, ex-partners, ex-wives, lovers. I mean, there's just... And by the way, all of these situations, they're real. Like, I bet you if I laid over every episode we've ever done, we've done 75 of them, somebody in this room can relate to somebody's situation. Well, and the most, the most fun are the ones with the lovers. I, I, the most fun to watch, not to make, are the oh, ones, you've walked with, away from all those the ones with dysfunctional people. Mm -hmm. But those are the ones that are most challenging for me, and those are usually the ones that I get burned the most, because I have this... Um, notion that I can fix everybody and everything and it's just not it's just not true. Well it's interesting because when you go into a business what we see first is you're meeting the people and, and like you've pointed out in in several episodes people are on their best behavior yep. on day one so what you're really looking at is the process and the product and it seems to me you look for the low-hanging fruit that is going to be easy for you to fix so if you put your money in you have this sense that you can fix the low-hanging fruit and get you know, get on, on no, balance I'll, again. I'll take you a little bit deeper into how the process works. So before I go to the business, I literally have no information, no financials. The only thing that I know is the name of the company, where it's located, the website, and I do, uh, I don't see that, see it, but I know that there's a background check done to make sure they're not like serial killers. Um, <laughs> I don't know if they've paid their taxes. And part of the reason that I wanted to do that, and, and the network and the producers of the show were heavily against it in the beginning because they thought I was operating from a place of weakness. And my perspective was I wanted to take people on the same sort of journey that they would go on if you're literally learning things for the first time. And what are the questions that you have to ask? The first couple hours of filming are always the ones, the, probably the thing you see the least. Because people are very, uh, they're very um, self-aware. 
aware of what they say, aware of like, and you have to really push them. And so what I have done is tried to build a personal connection with them during the first half a day. Talk about myself, talk about themselves, talk about their life, talk about why they got into business. Really, I don't ask them much about the business. I mean, I can see what they're selling. It's not, not complicated. But one of the things that I would advocate to everybody in this room as you think about raising money or starting a business or growing a business is that you really have to put your personal self out there and connect with people first, particularly investors, um, in my opinion, to be able to have them put a, an, a heart with a face, as opposed to a name with a face. What, what do you mean a heart with a face? I um, Because it's not just to investors, it's with employees too, we've seen in a number of cases. Yeah. It's with ex-partners, it's with customers. You, kind of, you have many, every person has many stakeholders in the business, as yeah. opposed to just customers. They do, I mean, customers are investors, right? They are essentially investors, they choose to give you revenue or not. Employees are investors. They choose to work there and give you their time. Yes, they get currency for it, but they give you more than the currency you can pay them. You may not realize it today. I just think, I think one of the mistakes in business today that people continue to make is not connecting with people. And, and it's simple to say, connect with your customers. Okay, great. It's simple to say, connect with your employees. Okay, great. But there's vendors and there's neighbors and their stakeholders. Um, and I just, what I'm looking for people to do and what I normally do at these events, and we'll do it a little bit later, is to get people to uncover who they really are, peel the onion back. And you have even, you know, sort of teased me about it, that on every episode somebody cries, right? It's like, I don't know what to tell you. It just happens. I've never, I've never seen even a soap opera with more people crying. <laughs> but look, I really believe in... You make them cry. But I will take this challenge, okay? It's not that I make them cry. When you get real with people and you get down into the weeds with them, no matter how tough they are, no matter how uh, uh, smart they are, if you really get on the level with them and you start talking about why they started the business and what it means to them and what's at stake and what, is, what have they sacrificed and what are they risking and how does this work and what happens if it doesn't work and what did you dream of when you were a little kid and where do you want to see this go and who are you doing this for? If you do that with anybody, I don't care how tough you are, you will break at some point. Like I break at it myself because we're not in business just to make money. We're in business to make money, to provide for other people, to provide for our families, to build a neighborhood, to do things for other people, to employ people. And on the surface, it feels very bold, but on the, on the you know, a couple layers down, it's a huge responsibility. And it's daunting. Like, I was emotional this morning about these hurricanes that have gone through and these people that have lost everything and the people that work for us. It, so. What I want more from people, and the reason that I continue to do this very difficult show, is I want to change people's minds about why business is successful. You know, Kevin O'Leary, who is a friend of mine, a kind of, <laughs> is, the, is the exact opposite of Mark Cuban, who is a, a dear friend of mine. And when you really study the human psyche of how to connect with people, and how to get people to do things. And think about how you get your kids to do things or how you get your boss or your employees to do things. It's really the art of persuasion. And the art of persuasion can be two things. It can be appealing to people's senses and inspiring them, or it can be intimidating them, right? And we know which one we don't like. And I just don't feel like we have mastered as a, as a humanity the art of persuasion by appealing to people's senses enough. And that's what the key to business is for me. You know, it, it definitely shows throughout the episodes that you're going in there, and in addition to saying, okay, we're gonna fix this process, we're gonna make more dollars per square foot, we're gonna up the margins, in addition to doing all this low-hanging fruit, I really see you trying to kind of impart your professional maturity onto the owners of these small businesses who haven't had as much 
business experience. But but, but I, I want to reel back just a little bit to. I, but I don't think I want to. I don't want to impart my professional whatever you said maturity. I don't have it. What I, want, I don't believe that. What I want. Well, I'll tell you what I want to impart on them. I want to impart, in all sincerity, James. I want to impart the th mistakes that I made, and the things that I went through, and the sacrifices that are more private than public. I want to impart the emotion. The professional maturity is, honestly, it feels like that's the after effect. That's what they get later. What they get from me up front is me trying to get them to understand how to think about themselves and other people in business. And really, that's all. I, and it's all done with the backdrop of margins and infographics and renovations. It, that stuff is just like, you have to, you have to move the business forward, right? But that's why I do the other stuff. Right, so, so often what I see you do is, is, like you were just saying, you try to, you try to give the entrepreneurs a sense of what their story is, and that story will then kind of filter through into the process and the product. So I'll get, I don't want to give too many specific examples just in case yeah. people haven't seen the shows, but I'll give one specific example that stood out for me it was in Flex Watches uh, last season. They were having a hard time coming up, they, they were a watch company that had some impact uh, investing related to it, yep. and uh, they were having a hard time developing what their corporate story, what their, what their vision of their product was, and you were trying to make one of the owners realize what that story is, to bring it out of him. You sensed it, he wasn't quite comfortable with it. So he had lost his mother a few years earlier, mm -hmm. and you spoke about losing your mother. Yeah. And, and in part, uh, you know, that was to kind of allow him to, to relate to you so that you can communicate the same language with him. But at the same time, it seems like he had to deal with something you had already dealt with. Like you were very mature about the way you were saying it, and yeah. he was, of course, coming to, yeah. to tears. So, so, so I wanted to ask, what happened when you lost your mother? How did you deal with it in your business? Um, I don't know that I've ever really dealt with it. I don't know that I've ever gotten over it. You know, I think about it a lot, and it definitely affects the way I run my businesses. It, it, it definitely forces me to be more empathetic um, uh, than I probably would be if I didn't think about it. It's very odd. I think losing my mother, and I'm an only child, um, which is probably pretty obvious to people, uh, but I'm an only child, and and I suffered as a child from fear of abandonment a lot. Well, and, and just to mention, you yeah. you were born in yeah, was born Civil in War torn Beirut. Yeah. You you were adopted by an, a somewhat entrepreneurial yeah. family. I, Where I did mean, they look? My I I people like to tell me that I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I I. I don't know that that's the case. I mean, I lived in a foreign country, but I was nine months old when I came to this country. And I was adopted by wonderful parents who were very entrepreneurial, who were great providers. My parents were blue collar to the core. They were from Youngstown, Ohio. They moved to Miami. They were blue collar. Um, but even through all that, uh, in suffering from anxiety and suffering from, I was molested. I had an eating disorder. I attempted suicide twice. And when I tell people all those things, I don't tell people those things because I want them to feel sorry for me. I tell them those things because I want them to be like, oh, all right, well, I could relate to that. I get that. And it's funny you bring up the Flex watches, guys, because what I really wanted the three boys from Flex, I shouldn't call them boys, but the three young men from Flex to do is to gain confidence in what they wanted to do with their lives. Because they, they are, they could, be, they could have been selling shoelaces. What they were really selling was, they're, they're a sales and marketing group. And they now, uh, and I think one of them may be here. Is Travis here? There he is, hello Travis. That's one of the three boys, young men. Uh, they, Great episode, yeah, Travis. <laughs> but, they, but they really are hustlers. They're promoters. And so now they're involved in every single web business that we have. And I just call them up and they take it over. And so that for me was like, I said to Travis, like, what do you want to do with your life? He's like, I just want to be a part of something. And that's what you really find with business owners is that when they're lost, they just want to be a part of something. And that, and telling your story is important so that we know which way to, to push you. So, so how did you kind of come back from 
Like, how do you deal with this anxiety, with this, I guess, in, in, in many cases, depression? Like, how, you're obviously, you were successful long before you started yeah. the show. Like, what was, what was the evolution that, that, that helped you find that success? I mean, I still suffer from depression and anxiety. I really do. And I think part of the reason that I keep as busy as I do um, and keep as many things moving as I do is so I don't have to think about it. I mean, that's just an honest answer. Like, I, I really do. If I spend too much time by myself, like, I'm eating a bag of Cheetos. And so I try to keep moving um, in an effort to not fall into that trap. But there are plenty of times where I fall into a big black hole. Um, and I wouldn't call it a mental disorder. I would call it, I would just call it, that's just who I am, you know? Um, and business for me has been the great neutralizer. And I always tell, I do a lot of work with bullied kids, and I always tell kids that are bullied, and I always tell adults that have uh, bad relationships or bad divorces, if you want to gain confidence in yourself, get into business. Because it's the one way where you can control the outcome to a degree, and you can make these little, little sort of goals and have wins, and little goals and wins. And it's like Legos. You have these building blocks, but there are days that the wind knocks all the blocks down. But again, I think, to, to put the blocks back up, you have to do the internal work. And you see this in a lot of the episodes. Yeah. People are so resistant to your suggestions. I mean, of course, it's part of the arc of the story. Like, yep. you know, they call you because they need help, but then they're resistant to the help. They and, really and, are, though. They really are resistant. Yes, but that's, again, part of the, part of the arc of the hero a little yeah. bit. Like, they, the, the challenge is on for both you and them yep. to kind of come together on these changes and, and figure out a better solution and a better company. But again, it starts with putting the blocks back together. They're, they're all in a state of despair. That's why they called you. You were in a state of despair at some point. Even now sometimes. Well, well what, what's, a business that's occur, what's a business mistake that's occurred for you that really kind of changed your outlook or improved your outlook on business? So I have a couple things. Um, you know, there's plenty of deals that I invest in that don't go well. And sometimes they don't go well because of mistakes that I make, choices that I make, paths that I take them down, and they're wrong. Like, like what? What's an example? Um, I would say Farrell's, which is here in LA, is a good example. So, you know, I chased Farrell's, which is a 40-year-old brand, and got involved with some people that I thought were going to be able to fix it. I left them with the keys to the car, and they crashed the car. And we did an episode on it, and we're going to have another hour about how I had to literally let most of them, if not all of them, other than one person go and start over. I take responsibility for that because I misjudge people's character. And the biggest mistake that I make in business is that I fall in love with people. I just do. I fall. I'm like, oh my God, I really like this guy. And so in one breath, I'm telling people, people process product. You got to focus on people, only on the people. You got to really, you know, like the people. And there are moments in time where I, I, I almost romanticize about the people. And then I'm like, well, they can't do any wrong. And I leave them with the keys and they rob the shop. But let me, let me ask you about that because with, pro with process, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's easy, but for you, with your business experience across yeah. so many industries, you're able to say, okay, we're going to change manufacturers, we're yeah. going to change how we buy yeah. this, we're going to um, collect data appropriately, and, and we're going to teach the owners how to know the numbers of their business. But with people, you see in so many of the episodes how you go in, and even in the first episode, you're noticing, oh, this owner seems a bit resistant. Or in the Farrell's episode, uh, the, the two main partners they, the, the, the CEO was kept blaming the other partner, and you noticed right away that was a, a right. toxic problem. And it went on. And yet you got involved with that toxicity, which, which we all knew, we all watching it knew this was going to be a problem. Cause, because there's, the producers or editors are signaling this is going to be the problem. You knew it was going to be a problem. I didn't know it was going to be a problem. And I'm really in it. You know, it's very easy when you're in it, it's very difficult. And so for those of you that are in business, it's always... And this is probably why I'm not harsh on people. When you are a business owner, it's very easy to get lost in the weeds. And it's very easy for other people to be like, oh, you should have done this and you should have done that. It's easy because we're standing on the uh, outside. I'm not saying should have, by the way. I'm saying no, no, it's I, edited I in such a way no, also as a signal. No, but I, wanted, I, I think it's important for the, the people here to understand how to think about it differently, though, James. It, it's, it's very easy when somebody's on the outside I'm not saying you, I'm saying even me, like I do it. 
to point out the flaws. And part of the reason that I'm more tolerant of the business owners is because I couldn't imagine what it would feel like to have somebody come in, like you could, anybody in this room could come into my businesses and find things that are wrong. No doubt about it, 100%, and find mistakes that I make. And so the goal isn't to really be like, oh, I caught you, you suck at this. It's really to be, hey, have you thought about it this way? And what I really want all of us to do for each other, and this is why I fight so hard for this, is I want all of us to just help point out things in a respectful, colloquial way. And not to be like, you know, you suck and you're stupid. I, I just like, I, I already know I'm stupid. I don't need you to tell me. And but, so, but when you see like one of the partners say to the other partner, you're stupid yeah. in episode number one. Yeah. Now, I don't know if it's really that's how it's happening in the timeline. No, that's how it happens, yeah. So, so what, what, again, you, you, you know you have an enormous sense you can fix the process and the product, maybe, you know, in most cases. Yeah. Why do you think the people are as easy to fix? Are, why they are as easy? Why do you think that, they're, that in those cases they're um, going to be as easy to fix? Because I'm really good at understanding people's motivations and why they want to do a certain thing or why they want to act a certain way. And I think a lot of it came from my introspection over the years of how to fix myself, or try to at least. And I am one of those men that are super cool with being in touch with his feelings. And I can talk about it with anybody. And I know that if you really, like I, I could take anybody in this room, no, I put a million dollars on it and get to the core of what motivates them and why they do what they do, but what the real reason is. Because people will tell you on the surface there's a reason, but sometimes people do it because they have something to prove to their dad that didn't treat them right, or they weren't, did not do well in one area and they want to prove something. Most people that get in business get in business because they have something to prove to themselves, to somebody else, subconsciously, that is why I think people become entrepreneurs. They're creative and they want to stand out and they have something to prove. And the reason that I'm able to get inside of people's minds and identify it is because I take myself to where they are. And, and so in doing so, you kind of essentially unlock that resistance because that once you are able to communicate to them on what's their pure motivation as opposed to maybe some ego-driven motivation, they're able to say, okay, you're right, uh, spending $40 on this process instead of $20 doesn't make sense. Yeah. Or, or whatever it is. You're, you're, but, you so know, but you know those are just microcosms, right? Right. Like that's just, a, for me, when I pick on one topic, like why did you do X, it's really an exercise in showing them an example of something so that they understand that their logic is flawed. It's all about, it, when you're trying to fix your own business or f help other people, all you're trying to do is get them to understand the logic behind their decision making. Not specifically like, why did you make that product at that factory for $40 when you could have done it for 38? It's like, I don't care about that. Like, but why did you think that was a good idea? Uh. What was the reason that, what took your brain down this path? And usually, they'll tell you, if you really just keep pushing. And then once they can figure out where their logic is flawed, there's a good chance that they'll start to correct their other, the other actions that come from that same logic. It's, it's, it's interesting because, again, I sort of see, of course, every business that you're invested in has a product and they have a process. And you're investing, again, as we said earlier, because you see some ways in which those things could be improved so the value of your investment could go up. But it all stems from the people, and like you say, almost this, this self-awareness about what they're doing, like unlocking that, that self-awareness. And so I'm wondering, even prior, decades prior to the show, what did you do personally to sort of help yourself start unlocking that self-awareness? I mean, you, you, you went from small RV companies and car dealerships to now running a, a multi-billion dollar camping world. What, what, was a mis what was a mistake there along the way that taught you a lot about yourself? So you could successfully build these businesses. Thinking that I had all the answers, that was the mistake. Uh, you know, I, I had good financial success pretty early on. I was one of the original guys at a company called AutoNation which is the largest publicly traded auto retailer. And that was back in 2000. So I got out of college in 95. I ran for office 
uh, and as a 20 year old as a, for Congress in Miami at, tw at 20, oh my God. Um, Why did you think you could win? <laughs> <laughs> well, I almost won, though. Which was crazy. 55% to 46 I, or something. I lost by like three or four points to a three-term incumbent. And he was a Cuban-American. And the bulk of my district was in Little Havana. Huh. And it, Miami is a Republican community. And I ran as a Democrat. So I would even say today, like, if I knew a little bit more, I would have kicked that guy's ass. But, <laughs> but, but what the reason that I did it is because I wanted to prove something to myself. My grandfather actually said to me, this is what prompted really, I think, my whole life. My grandfather had said to me when I got out of college, I had these different ideas, and he said to me, you don't make decisions without clearing them with me. And I was like, all right. And then he finished the sentence with, and, and you'll never be anything without me. I was like, okay, wait a minute, that feels weird to me. And the next day is when I went and registered to run for office. And then that next morning I got fired, and I lost my paycheck and my car, and. I was like, okay, maybe that wasn't well thought out. Um, but I realized that I could survive it. And I think for me, and I think this applies to everybody, if you're gonna take chances, if you're young and single and you don't have kids, you can be reckless. As you get older and you have a family and you have children and you have people you're responsible for, it has to be more calculated. And while I'm not married and I don't have kids, I still felt like as I got older and I was responsible for more people, my decisions had to be less cavalier and more calculated. And as I started to hone those like a, like a knife, like I started to sharpen them. And How, what's, what's an example? Uh, again, with, your, with yeah, your original businesses. An example of, an example of what? Of how you started to hone your, your, your business skills because you- I started you to ask other people what they thought. Hmm. I started to get other people's feedback before I just made a decision as if I knew it all. I started to listen more. Um, and I started to dialogue with people uh, that I thought just knew more than I did, even if they didn't. I would ask everybody questions. I, I almost, in a weird way, turned into an infant. I mean, seriously, I turned into an infant again. You know how, like, if you, anybody has kids, and I don't, but if I've seen it, if you have kids, like, the kids ask like a million questions in the car. Like, what are we doing? Where are we going? Like, how does this work? I just kept asking questions from everybody all the time, and I started to, I started to absorb it. And, um, and I think I'm a pretty quick study, but I started to ask questions. Well, it, it, it shows in, in at least two ways that I want to um, recount from the episodes. One is, it seems like you're able to go into any industry, whether it was um, Doesn't matter. the, the soup it. company or a t-shirt business yeah. or whatever, and you seem to know exactly. Well, with soups, you should have 72% margin instead of 54% margin. Mm -hmm. Like, how, did you, how do you know for every industry what the exact it's, margin should be on like, their I don't tomato know. grease? I don't know what it should be exactly, but here's what I do know. I know that what they're doing today doesn't work. And I know that if you're making coffee, there's water and there's beans. It's not that complicated. And I know what coffee sells for. And so if you could just almost do the Rain Man math really quick, it's like water's free and the beans cost X. And they, it's this much a pound to buy them green and it costs this much to roast it and it's selling for this much and this is the yield. And so it doesn't really matter to me what the business is. And I don't know anything about coffee. Like I know nothing. But I understand the general principles of you have water and beans and you make coffee. Like I get it. And the same applies for soup. And the same applies for manufacturing gazebos. It, it doesn't kind of matter. I just break it down to the simplistic terms. And I'll give you my little, I have a little cheat sheet, not a literal paper, but I have a little trick that I trick my mind into. I always turn my mind into a consumer and not a business owner. And I think about, would I buy that? What would I pay for that? And I really work hard. I really have to work hard at it to constantly flip back from business owner to consumer. What would I think about this? How would I see this? What if it looked like this? Why doesn't it feel this way? And I ask myself that. Would I buy this? And if my answer is no, then what are the things that would have to happen for me to do it? And that is, and nobody gets to see that process because it's in my head, but that is ultimately how I'm able to go into a lot of businesses. And, and it's, it's almost an arbitrage. And everybody should do that to their own business. 
Yeah, I, I agree, but, but for investing in, in, in particular for you, it seems there's an arbitrage because you'll go in there, see a product that's doing middling well. Like all of these businesses are in business. Yeah. So they have customers. Kind of. Kind of. But they have customers to some extent, like the, the soup company had yep. over a million dollars in yep. revenues. Yep. And you were, to, you were able to say, oh, it feels heavy, or you didn't like some of the tastes, or whatever, and you didn't like how the, mess, the menu was presented. And or I didn't like the fact that it had 9,000 calories and 1,000 yeah. grams of sodium. In their, like in their logically, lightest soup. Logically, it was like, this is a bad idea. Right, so, so for you, and to some extent, and for the business owner, that's an arbitrage, because there's these things that you can fix relatively easily. They're not hard to fix. Um, but to your point earlier, it's almost like you have to coach the owner into seeing that not only are these problems, but then have understanding that if, if these are problems, what other problems exist in the business. But I also wanted to say, so to some extent, you're, you're coaching them. But then there's another thing you do in a lot of the episodes, which I think is really critically important for any entrepreneurship. You bring in the experts. So since Travis is here from, from Flex Watches, it was a great to see you brought in um, Russell Brunson, an expert internet marketer, and um, he taught them about internet marketing. You do this at every show. Well, it was funny. It was really funny how that happened. I just want to tell that quick story. So Russell contacted me like a year and a half ago and asked me to do an event in San Diego for him. And he said, look, I really like the show. I like what it stands for. And I... When I go to these events, if I have extra time, I like to sit in the audience and actually see what it's about. And I was fascinated by what, what funnel marketing was. I knew nothing about funnel marketing before, nothing. And I literally was in the audience with my jaw. I was like, my jaw dropped. So I started dialoguing with him and I met with him and his team after and I'm like, I have all these businesses, can you help me? I need help. And I have no problem admitting when I don't know something or need help. So I was in the car with Travis while we were filming the episode and I had Russell in the back of my mind because I was like, it feels like this could really work because there's a story and I just, only from what I learned from Russell. So I said to Travis, hey man, I met this guy at some event in San Diego. Now I didn't know that Russell was like pretty well known. And I said, I met some guy that does this thing called like, like funnel marketing or something. I don't know, it's like the internet and clicking. I just, I was explaining. The World like, Wide Web. He, he looked at me. I remember we were driving past downtown on the freeway. We were heading to a warehouse. And he looked at me and he's like, bro, did you just say Russell Brunson? I was like, yeah. He's like, that guy's a legend. And I was like, really? And he's like, yeah. I was like, all right. And I left it there. And that's when I, I was like, all right, I'm going to get this guy to come help him. And ultimately, we're all better when we can get people that, can, that are experts in an area, and they can help me, they can help the business owner. It just moves, moves the business faster. Right, and, and it's not like you're going to teach the company about internet marketing. I don't know anything but, about that. But you, did, you do this in every, in every company, in every show, and it's not, I don't even think it is intended as a, to, because it's a great part of the story, but it really is, I think, important for entrepreneurs to, to ask for help. So you, 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 and you have such an enormous network, um, you're able to bring it in. But let's say, like, like with the t-shirt guy, Delacios, oh, uh, uh, you God. brought him into the, the two women who- He's a disaster. But, but in the show, to help him, you brought him- Why with, did you have to pick that one? <laughs> I apologize. But, but to help him, you brought him in to the, with the, the two women who are fashion designers. Yep. So he could learn, so even though he, had a, uh, he was creative, he could learn from people who really knew the fashion business. Yep. And you do it in every industry, so we'll, we'll get off of him. But uh, you, you do it with every but industry, But I want to tell you, it's funny because I keep referencing this. When, when, I first, when we first started making the show, the network was not in favor, the network and the producers were not in favor of me doing that. They were like, yeah, but you're supposed to be the guy. I was like, the guy that what? I don't know everything. And I said, and it almost comes off, it comes off uh, like, right, if you were to start teaching about internet yeah, it marketing. Just doesn't, it doesn't, it's not authentic. I don't know anything about it. And so I'd rather just acknowledge and, and, and have people be like, oh, well, he didn't know anything about this, but he knew some guy that did. And so for me, business is about finding resources. And the reason that I'm adamant about that is because I want to show people that one person, two people, three people can't solve everything. Sometimes you have to go outside and get a resource to learn. So, so you're able to do it because of, uh, you know, you're invested in hundreds of businesses, yep. you, you have the profit and CNBC behind you. Yep. How does the average entrepreneur 
um, let's say a t-shirt designer or a suit maker, go out and find someone who's better at it than them to get mentorship or coaching? Well, I didn't always have, first of all, I don't know that I would say that that people are behind me. I would say that I do a job for them and nobody finds me those resources. That, that nobody makes phone calls and finds those resources. It does help today that I can get Target to take a meeting. Sure, fine. But before the show, it would be the same thing. You don't have to find the best expert at something. You can, there's ways to go onto the internet, do research, find people that have a proficiency in something. Sometimes you have to hire a consultant. Sometimes you just have to go into a store and ask somebody a question. I think what happens for people is that they, their pride gets in the way that they don't want to say, I don't know. And that may be the single biz, big, biggest mistake other than people, is people's unwillingness to say, I don't know. Do you, I, don't, do you, I don't know the answer. Do you think, do you think um, I, I always call this the, the smoking crack bias. So an entrepreneur, an okay. entrepreneur makes their product and they think this is it, this is the best, I don't, it's better than all the competition because I did it and I put all this time into it. Yeah. So there's a cognitive bias involved. It's like a sunken cost. Pride of Fallacy. authorship. You call yeah. it crack, I'll call it pride of authorship. <laughs> All right, I'll call it crack. <laughs> I'm, I'm comfortable with that. And, and I think a big challenge is to let them know that uh, there's other ways, they're afraid to ask for help. Would you say the main job of entrepreneurship, to some extent, is to start off asking lots of questions, even every day? I'll go with the second part of your statement, every day not start off. Every day you should be asking questions. And you should ask questions of people that are in your industry and people that are not in your industry. And, and when you see things or you go places and you're fascinated by it, what's wrong with just asking like, hey man, how did you come up with this idea? Like, what is this? How did you make this? Why did you think of this? Why did you do this? Why did... And the other business owners love to talk about their business. And so if you ask them questions, they'll give you time. They may tell you initially that you're busy, but if you say to them, look, I really just want to learn from you, people will give you that time. And I don't know, whatever neighborhood that you guys live in, you can go meet a couple of business owners and just ask them, like, why did you get started? What are the big challenges you've had? What are some things, what kind of advice would you give me? If, if I asked anybody in this room for advice, which I would love to, they have, nobody has any problem giving advice. They have problem taking advice. <laughs> right? And so... I'm, what I'm advocating is go out and ask people questions. If you're unwilling to take advice, at least go, if you're unwilling to have advice put on you, at least go out and ask people questions so you can get the answers you want. So I still want to know from your own business, which is you know through yeah. various yeah. mergers and, and so yeah. on has become Camping World, a huge business, where did you find yourself, like a specific example where you found yourself stuck and maybe even scared, and questions and reaching outside helped you? 2008 and 2009. Uh, August of 2008, September of 2008, when the market crashed, um, was probably the, my darkest moment in business because, you know, you guys remember the housing market was terrible, it caused the recession. Oh, I didn't remember that. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, it's a funny thing. And the auto business was terrible. Well, try being in the RV business, which is a combination of the housing market and the car market. <laughs> and, you know, lenders telling you they're going to call all the loans in and nobody can get financing and all that stuff happening. And it was, it was the dark moment where I started reaching out to people that, that I thought could, maybe I, to be candid, maybe I was reaching out to them for them to console me, to tell me it was going to be okay, because when you're scared, like when I'm scared. Well, who did you reach out to? Oh man, I reached out to, I reached out to old friends. I reached out to uh, family members that I hadn't talked to. I reached out to other business owners. I typically, this is a, maybe a bad thing. I typically reach sideways as opposed to up. I'm not like when people ask me who my mentor is. I'm not like, well, my mentor was blah blah. My mentor is my mom, and and while as corny as that sounds, my mom ruled with an iron fist. She, was a, she understood business. Um, she held me to the highest standard. Um, and so from, from that standpoint, that's that answer. But when I want to get information, I typically reach out to peers, and I even actually go down to employees. And you know, I had a situation happen a couple weeks ago 
where I made some comments that got me into a little bit of trouble. And uh, what was interesting to me is that I didn't hear from anybody that was um, a peer. I heard only from people that worked with me or for me. Can I ask what the issue was? Yeah, so I made a comment about, about um, you know, hate and violence in America and, you know, my wonderful network decided to spin it into something else and, you know, it turned out to be a big social media thing because people thought I said, if you don't like Trump, don't shop in my business, which I said, if you're okay with violence and hate, don't shop in my business, but it's okay. So for about two weeks I had a social media hellstorm and boycotts of the businesses and things of that nature, which is fine, you know, I, I, I got over it and got through it. But what was more amazing to me is in the face of adversity, it was very interesting f for me that I had more phone calls and more text messages and more emails and more handwritten notes from people that were in my organizations that I didn't even know. Salespeople, people that worked in the kitchen, that were just like, we got you, this is good, we're gonna get through this. And there was even people that wrote me and said, look, I don't love what you said, but you're my guy and you've been there for me from the beginning. And it was, I would say it was definitely a tipping point for me. And it was interesting that two weeks ago, I've had probably the biggest tipping point I've had, which is when you take care of your people as best as you can, you really will find out when shit goes bad, who's going to be there. And I definitely took a mental note of it. Hmm. I definitely took a mental note of it, and I shouldn't, but I did. And Why shouldn't you? Uh, because I don't think it's good to keep score. I don't think it's good to do that. And I, 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 um, I'm really working in intellectually to try to not keep score. But, but, but in your 10 rules of success in the last episode of, yep. of the yep. last season, uh, you, rule number two is treat your employees great. I forget the no, exact No, treat word. them better than your customers. And, and My employees that's are more important. important than my customers, and customers get pissed off at me all the time when I say it. And my theory is the following. If you take care of your people, they'll take care of your customers. Like you don't have to, like, I can't take care of nine million customers, but 10,000 employees can take care of nine million customers. And if they're not taken care of and if they don't feel good and they don't feel inspired and they don't feel like they have a path to success, they're not going to have your back. And, and the, the way to show that to people is customers lie sometimes. They do. They just make stuff up, uh, especially when they want stuff for free. And I watch them, and I watch them do it via email because any customer can email me easily. I don't have an assistant. It's easy to get a hold of me. And customer will say, this person said this, and I want this free, and I want this, to, and I'll literally include the employee in the chain, and I'll start the dialogue. And I'll do my research, and if I find out that the employee did the right thing, I'll tell the customer, you can't shop with me anymore. Because you, you, you made this up, and I have to have my employees back. And sometimes it doesn't go right for, for us from a business standpoint, but the employee remembers. Mm -hmm. and, and, they, they, and I say to them, now, I just have to tell you this. I had your back because you were right. But if you, but I, I'm going to have your back if you're wrong, but this discussion is going to end differently. So you got to do the right thing by people. And that gets through their head. So, so, so going back to 2008, 2009, you didn't finish. How yeah. did you get through that? Because it seems like that was a disastrous oh, period for your industry. Um, the way that I've gotten through it is to not forget it. To not forget it. And when I go into businesses today and they tell me we can't cut this and we can't cut that and I can't do this and I can't do that, I always take my mind back to, the, I had to cut a couple thousand people, we had to close a bunch of stores, um, I was probably demoralized, I was embarrassed because I felt like I was responsible for it. Um, it definitely humbled me. How, how did you get over that feeling of being demoralized? I didn't. I don't think I got over it. Um, I can suppress it, but I don't think I got over it because I always say to myself, like, what could I have done to avoid it? I should have known better. I should have known the housing market was going to crash. I should have known the market was going to crash. I should have known credit was going to tighten up. And that's not logical, but I do tell myself that. And so I'm definitely quicker on my feet today to be anticipating and thinking. And I'm not as cavalier with new ideas. I'm not as cavalier with things because I'm always scared that what's right around the corner is something bad. 
So, so when did you decide, so you, you built up this great business, you know, it's, it, it sounds like you have a great bench, so you don't have to be yeah, as involved. great bench. And, uh, you know, that allows you to do, you know, be invested in a hundred other businesses, do a... Uh, uh, but I'm involved. Like, Travis, stand up for a second. How involved am I? <laughs> That's a sit good down, answer. sit down, sit down. <laughs> like I'm involved. I can tell you that I'm involved. Comedian over there. No, I know, but he's, but he's, he means because he does tell me sometimes, like just to, you know, go away. Um, but but I've seen I've seen owners tell you to go away, and they say it in a way that's not so friendly. So how do you assess when you're you're the one who really knows when you should go away or not? In, in this role that you've taken on for yourself? I have to know when to go away. Um, and in all sincerity, they don't tell me to go away. The, 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 the good ones don't. The good ones love the interaction and they love it because the theory that they have is, if he goes out on the, on the plank with me, a plank's gonna be longer. We'll have more fun, we'll take more chances, we'll try more stuff. If he's not engaged, maybe he's not interested. And we have to almost be more reserved and take less chances because he may be willing to cut us quicker. So I know that's in their head. They may not say it, but I know it's in their head. Well, you make an interesting point about the plank being longer with you. Yeah. And in part, that's because um, you put up, I mean, I mean, the structure of the show is you go in there, about halfway through the, the, the episode, you or a third of the way through the episode, you're writing a check. You're not doing any legal work. The check and a handshake is the legal work. Right. And uh, I mean, I'm sure there's contracts later on. I don't know. But sometimes uh, there's not. Right. So you're taking a lot of, uh, of, of personal risk that they're going to be good guys. And it's to their benefit to have extra money and to have your resources. But I want to kind of get down to the tactics of negotiation. Like you, it seems like you, you, you figure out pretty quickly a valuation that's going to make you a lot of money. You're going to take over, you know, sometimes you, you take up to 50% of the company. That's the first flaw. I don't negotiate as if I'm going to make a lot of money. I negotiate if I can make good money. Hmm. And my theory is if I take too much, if I don't put in enough money today, I'm going to have to put it in tomorrow. So let's just get right to it. Like I know what the business needs for the most part and to, to try to like dribble in a little thinking that the deal is just going to get better for me later because the company will need money again. It's, it's like we're just playing games here. If the business needs a certain amount of inventory and it has to retire a certain amount of debt. It, it, either, it either gets solved now or it gets solved later. But it doesn't go away. So that's, so that's number one. Number two is, if I take too much of the business, then the people that I'm investing in don't have enough skin in the game. And I need it to be really interesting for them. And so I'm willing to lower my return threshold and my quote unquote yields because ultimately I can't be there managing the business every day. When I do a deal at Camping World, I literally take the deal all the way to the edge because I have a business that's built for 15 years that has infrastructure. I make the best deal that I can and I grind out the last penny. It's different because it's gonna go, it's gonna be acquired and it's gonna go into a business that is a four or five billion dollar company and it's got the infrastructure for it. When I invest in these small businesses, I'm really ultimately investing in the, in the people that are there. Because in my mind, I say to myself, if I can't sell watches or enough watches to get a yield, how else can I get a return on my money? And none of the business owners know this until like right now. I ultimately am investing for the long game and I do more interviewing on the candidate than I do on the business and nobody really knows that. Because if I want to build a larger holding company and everybody in that group is going to elevate to have a bigger role, I also have to know that the person can do more. So in the case of, of, of a flex or, or a, you know, 40 or 50 of the other businesses, I'm making an investment in a principal commodity. So what's the return on that? I'm making an investment in other doors that are going to get opened up. So I'm making an investment in that. And I'm making an investment in a few of the individuals that I think can do more inside the whole organization. There isn't a business today that I invested in that is in good standing where those business owners 
are only involved in their business. There is not one today. Well, what do you mean? So, um, I'll use Travis again as an example. Travis, uh, you might Jesus, as well. Don't come up here. <laughs> um, there, there, there is not one single business that I'm invested in today where that business owner, that's, a, that's in good standing, that, that that business owner is only spending his time in his specific business. Every single one of them has some role or has done something for another one of the businesses. So they may be handling the marketing, or they could be handling the production, or they could be doing some training, or they could be doing something. Is that to not only help your other businesses that you might be involved in, but to help them, like by teaching they'll, they'll learn? It's, it's two things, it's three things. One, um, I, don't, I, don't, I can't do it myself. Like that's legit, I legitimately can't do it myself. Two, I like having lots of different ideas. And three, they don't realize it, but I do. It's very um, fulfilling to help somebody else in business and to see them succeed and to see them grow. And I want them to start to realize, because I'm not gonna do this forever. And I want other people to be able to do what I do, even if they do it in a different form. And even if it's in smaller increments of dollars or it's, it's, or it's with their time, I think that's how the small business world gets better, is that everybody just does a little bit. So I want them to be cross-trained. I want them to, I, I was doing an episode the other day here in LA for a guy out of New York who has a streetwear brand. And it just so happens that one of the guys in my LA office loves streetwear. So I brought him into the episode. I was like, okay, you're gonna help this guy. He wear, you wear these kind of clothes, right? Yeah, okay, well you know our process, right? Tell this guy this is not gonna go down this way. And he looks at him, he's like, hey man, if you want this to work, I'm telling you, I did it myself, like I went through this, you have to do it this way. And I said, okay, you guys now have a relationship, he's now gonna be your contact. And he's like, oh, oh, I didn't really ask for that. And I was like, yeah, but you have to help him, because I helped you, now you have to help him. But you know, this is, this is interesting again though, because we, we even started off this hour, um, oh, ignore that, we're blowing the clock, can you turn that off? So, okay. <laughs> We'll only go a few minutes more. But uh, uh, we started off this hour talking about your productivity, really. Like, again, I said it before, but I'll say it again. You run a multi-billion dollar company. You're not only invested in these hundred or plus companies that you did through the profit, but you're, you're involved with them. As, as Travis said, yeah. you know, sometimes too much. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and the other thing I'll point out is that, you know, I do a lot of these types of conferences often People running billion dollar companies come with their, their entourage, everything is like... I came in an Uber. Yeah, you came, you came in an <laughs> Through Uber. Through the back door. You came know. in an Uber, you had trouble op getting the back door open, like nobody was like helping you out. And you even mentioned you don't have an assistant. So, so I, I wanna really understand, life could be pretty busy sometimes and people don't understand how to manage uh, even the tiniest of tasks, let alone, you know, the thousands of tasks you probably have to deal with each week. So part of it, it seems is you connecting people and also having a great bench. So again, it all boils down to, to people, but what's, what's some other or-, well, or, or in, fair, in fairness to, to most people in this room, right, I, I don't have kids and I don't want to minimize that because I have business associates who have kids and I, I, it's a sacrifice that I've made and I don't have to pick them up from school, and I don't have to get their lunch ready, and I don't have my, to pick my kid up when he's sick, and I don't have to go to soccer practice, and I don't want to minimize that, because for small business owners, that is a very big deal, and that's very real. And so, um, my businesses are my kids, and what a small business owner has to do, in my opinion, or a big business owner has to do, or anybody in this room, is, to find that balance between taking care of your family, which is a business by itself, a non-profitable business, and not taking on more than they can. And I'm blessed with a couple of things. I'm blessed with this financial freedom because I don't have kids. I have this financial freedom that I could take more chances on things. Because I'm like, if it doesn't work, I'll go sell cars, right? Um, so that's one. Where you started. Yeah, but that's one disadvantage. Like that's one advantage that I have that's not really fair. The second thing that I have is that my home life is different. 
and I, I'm not responsible for, for little, little people. And that's another difference. I think the third thing is, and it may come from my upbringing or my childhood, is that I try not to do things that I don't get enjoyment out of. And that may be my best advice. Is that, is that something you learned over time or you always did? I always did. Because I think that's I really was, key. I, think I was the last kid in dodgeball picked. And so what I decided was that I was never going to do business with people that I didn't like. That I wouldn't want to have over to my house or I wouldn't want to have a salad with. I just won't do it. And I've, there's a lot of people that I've met that have amazing businesses that could be great investments with 30% yields and blah, all the nonsense. But I don't like them. Like, I don't, I, don't, I don't necessarily like the way they think about their family or their community. I don't like their philosophy. I just don't have a good rapport with them. Like, I don't want to hang out with people that I don't like. So, so, so Marcus, it, it shines through everything you do, even what you're saying here, that it always, not always, always. Because, but, okay, let's say always boils down to the people, right. and then the process and the product is like, a side effect of good relationships no, with the, the pro people. The process and the product are the necessity to have a profitable business. That's the necessity. So it's almost like that is the thing that has to exist. But I'm willing to, to go into battle with you if you are a solid person that gives of their heart and soul and you work and you have a good idea and I feel like you're doing it for the right reasons. Together, we could, we could like fix the product. We'll find some, we'll get a new machine. We'll make it somewhere else. Like we could fix that. A process, like if I can't answer it, we'll get some smart person that'll come in and fix it. Like I don't, those things to me are like the least important things because I know, okay, we want to sell jeans. All right, great. This is what we have to do to do it. We have to be market driven. We have to have good fit. We have to do these other things. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Now, can you not be an idiot? And that, in the, and if you can't, if you can't avoid that, I don't care how good the genes are. We're not, we're not going to work between us. And 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 again, related to that, and related to the question about your efficiency, is constantly trying to surround yourself with good people, the people you would enjoy being with. And I cut my losses quick. Mm. That is the other thing. Mm. If I find out that I made a mistake, the old me would chase it and chase it and chase it because I didn't want to admit defeat. Do you think you learned that this in the show? I think I may have learned that on the show. Hmm. Yeah, that I needed to invest my time into people that wanted to, to give me the same time back. And I didn't necessarily, I would say that's something that I definitely learned. I, le I learned that on the show and I also learned um, that people hang on every word I say and I have to watch what I say. So, so, uh Two other questions. One is, um, if we were here a year from now talking, and you mentioned um, you've made sacrifices, part of it has been your work-life balance. Yep. If we were to be talking a year from now, um, how would you say the life part could have improved for you over the next year? I don't want to change my life. I love it. So, so, you, so the fulfillment in the business, like you say, the, the businesses are your kids, yeah. that fulfillment, and it shines through in the it's, show it's, and what you're saying. It's, um, I want to leave this world with a legacy. And the legacy isn't going to be how much money I make or how big Camping World gets. Like, that's awesome and I love it. It's my favorite thing. But my, I want to be the guy that changed the way people think about small business. And that, and that is really, yeah, that is, um, and I feel like I have the platform to do it. Um, and I feel like I have the platform to do it. And I want to be able to um, uh, do it in a way that is, that our kids today can say, you know what, the handshake does matter. Hmm. Like in the old days, like my dad used to tell me that people used to come into his grocery store in Youngstown, Ohio, and they would buy stuff and he would like write it down on a piece of paper and then they would just settle up their tab or whatever they called it. Like you just get credit at the store. And people would just be honorable and they would just do it. And that if you had a disagreement with somebody, you'd knock, you'd like get in your car and you'd go to their house and you'd knock on their door and be like, hey man, today it's like, nope, you gotta have credit, I'm gonna call my lawyer and it's like, ugh. And I, so part of the reason that I do my deals the way I do 
is I'm hoping that enough people are like, hey man, that guy does his, that works out for that guy and he does his deal on a handshake. I legitimately do deals on handshakes. At some point, for legal reasons, could be two years later, by the way. I think we just papered the flex deal like, like a month ago, right? It's because I, if you can't trust the people you're doing business with, that they're gonna do the right thing, then like, what is a piece of paper gonna do? So that's one. Two, I want people to know that, that you have to have a purpose in business. And it doesn't have to be all charitable. When people say to me, I want to have a business so my business can give money away, I always tell them, no. You need to have a business and it needs to be profitable. And it needs to be without any reservation of being profitable. And then what you do with that money is your own business. But don't, don't be like, oh, you know, have a business only to be profitable. I mean, only to be charitable. So that's, a lot, that's the second thing. The third thing is, and maybe the last thing is, what I wanted my legacy, what I want my legacy to be is that you don't have to be an asshole to be good at business. You just don't. And that, that, and that, and that by the way, is your rule number one in your 10 rules of success. Your rule number one is actually don't be an ass. And I've said that to Kevin O'Leary before. Like, <laughs> we, because we do, we do day side sometime on CNBC, and I say to him jokingly, like, I'm kidding him, but I'm not. And him and I are in a deal together. Did you know that? No. So he, uh, I'm going to tell you this story before we go into q and I always say to him, like, why do you have to be, why do you have to be an asshole to people? Like, it doesn't make people feel good. So there is a company that he invested in on the show. Um, and he made, and he likes to tout it as one of his most successful investments. And the people that he invested in are spectacular people. And I actually, after, I think a year after their deal, they called me and said, hey, we need help with our business. And we don't, we can't be on the show. We don't want to be on the show. We, we need $100,000. And we need, to, we need to take our business to the next level. And I said to them, I'm confused. I thought you have a deal with Kevin. And they said, we do, and Kevin's awesome, and we love him, and he's a great guy. And my point of the story is, if you're going to invest in a business, or if you own a business, you don't have to be the only one. More people is better than less people. And Kevin and I couldn't be further from different, but we're both able to be involved in a business that we offer different things to. We offer, I offer a lot of moral support and counseling and, and I'm a little tougher. He's more like, let's just get down to like how we're gonna sell more. And my advice to everybody in this room is whether you're an investor or a business owner, if you don't have partners today, you should not be opposed to it. I have partners at Camping World. I took the company public. There's, you know, there's 83 million shares out there. I like it because I feel like it makes me better. It makes me more accountable. I get different ideas. I would encourage people to take on partners if they can, and money shouldn't be the only reason. Brains or experience or resources should be one. Or if you're an investor in a deal, don't be the only investor. Get other people to invest so that you can, you can give more to the business. That would, be, that would be another piece of advice, I think. So, so Marcus, clearly, uh, your legacy is is shining through to many people. The show is, ex is extremely, I was about to say profitable, but also popular. It is profitable, <laughs> by the way. But uh, I, I also, we're not going to do a Q and A. Um, I was I was the Q. Okay. Um, but can we what, do one or two? Uh, it's up to. Can I be hundred percent in charge for two minutes? <laughs> can we get one question? Let's let's one question. It's up to these gonna... guys. Okay. All right. It's not like, it's not like this, the Olympics aren't coming on in a second. So one question, and it, ladies first, or ladies only. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Hang on just a second. Let no, me give I you can a mic. hear her, and I'll repeat it. I know. Right. I'll, I'll, I have a microphone okay. for her. Awesome. Carmen West. Carmen West. That's my stage name. And I'm from the great state of Ohio, so your family. Um, one of the things that I resonated uh, with you was that most of your companies are ran by women. And so that leads me to think about what I do with the U.S. Department of Commerce appointed by President Obama with ethnic-owned businesses. And so um, minority women have some of the toughest challenges in thinking about that 
ethnic businesses only are uh, represented by about 8% of those that get the opportunity to pitch. And they receive about a third of investment. What advice would you have for those businesses that are ethnic that are having challenges to get in front of people like you? Well, so can you repeat it just a little? No, I, yeah, the question was, I, I think the question was, what advice do I have for ethnic businesses that are trying to get in front of others to pitch their products or ideas? Uh, and, and, and I'll change the ethnicity to diversity because I think women are in that same category, right? Um, I don't know that I'm the best person for advice because I'm typically gender and, and colorblind to stuff. I don't see it. But I know that the rest of the world is not. Um, or m most other people can potentially not be that way. And so my advice to them is when you put your presentation together and when you put your story together, don't make your story about that. Neutralize the story and make it about what your offering is so that that doesn't have to be even a thought for the potential investor or receiver. Too often, I do see uh, companies lead with their, lead with their um, heritage or lead with their gender as opposed to lead with their business. And I would just advocate that who you are as an individual um, makes you special regardless of what gender you are or what race you are, right? B but as a business owner, I want you to lead with your experience, your knowledge, your expertise, your appetite for information, your appetite for growth. You have to have your numbers right. You have to have your story right. You have to be able to answer those questions. Stand on your own two feet. And if you do that, somebody will, will find it. And they'll be the better person for it. And there will still always be people that even if you downplay your gender, downplay your ethnicity, they will make it an issue, but, but most people will not. Most people will not. And I'm working on an episode right now, I'm in the middle of it, with a young, with a young boy who's 13 years old. His name is Corey, he has Corey's Cookies. He was on the Ellen Show, he was Oprah, and he's a 13-year-old boy who wears nothing but suits. And he's adorable. Um, but his mom is the reason. His mom had him when he was 15. She aged out of foster care. And I originally went into the business thinking that I was going to try to help a kid business. And I decided in the process that I'm not in favor of kid businesses. I'm in favor of businesses, but the kid's not running the business. The mom's running the business with no support, no mentoring, no tutoring. And it, it, it hit me when she said to me, it's an African-American family, she said to me, Nobody's ever taken a chance on me. They always want, only wanted to exploit my kid. I don't know where to start. I don't know much about anything. What she did know is she raised her child. She put a roof over his head. She helps run his business. And all she wants is some direction. And I think that's what we all want. And for those of you that are looking for investments, make it about you and your business, not about who you are in terms of your race or your story or your gender. If you are an investor, then I would ask you, please, if you believe that that exists in the marketplace, then take a chance on somebody that you think deserves one who doesn't have the best presentation because they haven't been given the education to do it, who doesn't have the best story because no one's ever coached them. Take a chance on somebody and give them what they deserve Give them what you wanted when you were doing it. And that's hard. And I'm not saying you have to invest a million dollars. Sometimes you can just invest your time. It doesn't have to be money. And so that, I don't know if that's helpful. So, so and, that, and that's all the time we have for questions. So please uh, turn, the, turn the lights on for the audience. Turn the lights on. And uh, I want to do a selfie with the audience in the background. <laughs> I'll get in there. I'll get in there. Okay, that selfie. Alon. Yeah, everybody has to stand and, and clap. <laughs> you gotta